Dr. Tony Evans, Senior Pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship here in Dallas, Texas. He tells us this story, Nikki, when he was in the eighth grade and how he got suspended from school for fighting. Can you believe that the reason Dr. Tony Evans got suspended from school, Jackie, is because this boy had the audacity to touch his fried chicken. Now, we embrace our adversity here at Harvest, but you already know how we feel about our chicken. <laughs> Following this fight, the school had to call his father at work. Now, mind you, his father worked by the hour, which meant the father, hear this, had to punch out to come to see why his son, Mika, the preacher's kid at that, hadn't gotten kicked out of school. His dad arrives at the school, heads to the principal's office, and he sits where his son sat waiting. After hearing the story of how Tony got in trouble, his father responds to the principal by saying, Sir, you will never, ever, 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 ever have to worry about my son ever being suspended from school ever again. Walk outside, Dr. Evans' father looks at him, and I can only imagine, can you imagine with me the, the look that Dr. Evans' father has? And he looks at his son, and he asks him this question. Do you know how much this visit costs me? I'm sure you don't, but that's okay. Because I'm going to make, take the payment out on you. You hear a story like this, and you probably say to yourself, you know, Pastor Roland, um, the father could have let the son slide on this one. I mean, Pastor Roland, I mean, the boy did have the audacity to touch his fried chicken. And, and, and if you're thinking that way, I, I would say to that, perhaps he could have. The father could have said, Pastor Johnson, I'm, I'm not going to discipline you this time. Just don't do it again. But from what we are told in the story, it didn't play out that way. So the question is, why did the father choose to discipline his son? Here's a response. Because the father knew the best way to prove his love for his son was yeah. to discipline his son. Yeah. 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 In a similar way, we who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we too experience discipline by our Heavenly Father. Yeah. Yeah. Need proof of this? The writer of Hebrews in this epistle actually provides proof in this text to these Jewish Christians and us Christians today online and in person this morning that God's discipline proves his love for us and authenticates us as his children. That's the sermon in the nutshell. God's discipline proves his love for us and authenticates us as his children. Hope you kept your Bibles open this morning. Look at, look at verse 5 there with me. As we approach the text, we'll see that the writer of Hebrews poses a question in verse 5. You there with me? Yeah. says, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Please note that here in Hebrews 12, the word sons there is also sons and daughters. He goes on to say, he goes on to give these Jewish Christians this exhortation. He says, my son and daughter, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord 
disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom son or daughter he receives. This the exhortation here in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 6, actually derives from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. In the context of Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon is the one talking, but it is God who is viewed as the father. Why is this important to know? Because it helps us as the reader understand that this divine discipline is not from Solomon, but from God. Upon further review of the text, I believe it's safe to assume that the writer of Hebrews knew about this exhortation as well as these Jewish Christians. But from the words of the writer of Hebrews, they had forgotten about it. Not sure how they forgot because the text is not clear on that, but what the text is clear on is the discipline they were receiving from God. And hear me. The discipline they were receiving was not to discourage them to give up in any way. If anything, it was to motivate them to bear through the difficulty of it. See, the reason the writer of Hebrews mama even brings this exhortation to their attention is because he knew they were suffering persecution. Hear this, Will. Not externally, but internally. Basically, they were having a fight against their own sinful nature. So he wanted to encourage them through the words of Solomon that because God is the one doing the discipline, the response should be two things. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. Simply put, the writer of Hebrews is urging these Jewish Christians and us today in this room and even online don't make little of God's discipline yeah. as if it has no significance because it does. Yeah. Yes. And we don't need to give up when we are corrected by him. Yes. Yes. Well, Pastor Roland, I, I hear you. I, I really do because you're loud up there. I ain't got no choice. How does one not grow weary when experiencing the discipline of God? Good question is my response. The way for you and I to not grow weary when we are experiencing God's discipline is by studying the word of God. And hear me when I tell you, I understand that a lot of us have a lot going on, but I'm not just talking about two, three seconds of studying God's word. I'm talking about intentionally carving out time to actually study God's word to help you to not grow weary when you are experiencing God's discipline. Also, by praying to God and repenting of sin. So not only is it good for us to pray individually for certain things that we need, not only is it good for us to pray collectively as a church for certain things that we need, but we also need to make sure that in our prayers to God, we are repenting of sin. So not only, not only are we to study God's word, not only are we to pray to God and repent of sin, but we also, in order for us to make sure that we're not growing weary when we're experiencing God's discipline, is by listening to biblically, hear this, Sound sermons. Ooh, God. If you want to know what bothers y'all pastors a lot, is when we see people standing up and they just have the Bible closed like this as an accessory. Yeah. Yeah. Please know that I'm not talking about those motivational, quote unquote, biblical sermons because they got a Bible on their podium. We're talking about somebody who is actually exegeting, who is interpreting the scriptures, who is trying to figure out the author's intent of the text. Those are biblically sound sermons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that other stuff is just feel good stuff. Yeah. Not only should we study God's word, pray to God, repent of sin, listen to biblically sound sermons when we, for us not to grow weary when we are experiencing God's discipline, but we also do this by staying committed to the gathering of the saints. As far as I always says, it's okay to miss occasionally, but occasionally should not be should not turn to habitually. And lastly, ultimately, we are to trust and depend on God. That because He is the one that's allowing us to experience this discipline, that He will be with us, He will comfort us, and all we need to do is trust and depend on Him. If there's anything I want you to remember, I want you to remember this. God's discipline is formative, not destructive. Yeah. 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 Or let me say it to you this way. 
God's discipline, Chris, is not a form of abuse. The discipline we receive from God, hear this, is not meant to damage us, it's not meant to harm us, it's not meant to discourage us, nor is it meant to kill us. It is simply meant to correct us, and that correction is to better us. So this is why we can't become weary when we are corrected by God because his discipline is not to make us become weary, it's to make us better. Yes. Yeah. Let me repeat that. His yeah. discipline is not to make us weary, it's to make us better. Yes. And since I'm here, I got a little time, let me speak to the parents who are believers in Jesus, whether you're in person or online. If God's discipline is done in love, hear this, that means our discipline should mimic his way of discipline and not the world. I got to say this. God is not okay with us depriving our children of their physical needs. God is not okay with us shaming our children on social media. God is not okay with us having our children outside on the side of the streets with a sign explaining why they are being disciplined. God is not okay with us beating our children half to death and then try to justify our actions by using scripture. Well, the Bible says whoever spoils the rod hates their children. Yes, it does, but please know the rod is meant to correct us, not kill us. Our discipline is to reflect the love of God, not the evilness of this world. See, I expect the world, Chris. I expect the world, Jackie. I expect the world, Mika, to discipline their children this way because they are not believers. But we who are believers in Jesus are not to follow the example of the world. We are to be the example to the world by how we discipline our children in a God-honoring way. So the word for the parent or parents who are believers in Jesus and you have been disciplining your child or children in a way that's abusive, I say this in love, but you need to repent and stop it. In the second half of chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews keeps the visual of endurance by giving us these two exhortations from the text of how we should respond as children of God to the discipline of our Father. The first exhortation that you and I are given on how we should respond as children of God to the discipline of the Father is there in verse 7 and 8. Endure the fatherly discipline. Endure the fatherly discipline. After the writer of Hebrews reminds them of the encouraging words of Solomon to them in Proverbs, and then he has a few words for them in the eighth part of verse 7. I hope you there with me. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Just so you know, the word discipline that's used here in this text is actually used nine times throughout verses 5 through 11. I made sure I counted again so y'all won't put me on blast after service, but it's nine times that this word discipline is used throughout verses 5 through 11. This word discipline in the Greek, Darius, is a term for child rearing through instruction, training, and correction. So when the writer of Hebrews says it is for discipline that we have to endure, what he's saying is we as Christians are called to persevere and not give up when we are being corrected by God. So Mike, that was a that was a father, bro, uh, was trying to get his son not to quit so easily. He said, "Son, you you've got to hang in there and not quit." He says, "Son, look look at Abraham Lincoln. He didn't quit. Look look at Thomas Edison. He didn't quit. He said, look at Douglas MacArthur. He didn't quit." And then he looked at his son and he said, look at Elmo McCringle. I know I said the same thing. The son said, hold on, wait, wait a minute, daddy. 
Who in the world is Elmo McCringle? The father said, that's my point. See, he quit. <laughs> This is the point of what the dad is saying. He's saying to his son, what the same thing God is saying to us, don't throw in the towel when the going gets tough. God wants us to stand fast knowing that the discipline we're receiving from him is not because he hates us, but rather he's treating us as his children. If we weren't disciplined, if he, we weren't his children, he wouldn't discipline us. But because we are his children, he disciplines us. The writer of Hebrews himself poses the question. He says, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Simply put, just as sons and daughters of earthly fathers are not to go without discipline, sons and daughters of God, we are not to go without discipline as well. Because if he doesn't discipline us, look at what the writer of Hebrews says. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. I don't want to brush past that too fast, but did you just hear what he said? He said if you are left, here, here, here what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He said if you are left without discipline in which all participate, you are illegitimate children and not sons and daughters of God. If we as sons and daughters of God are left without discipline from God, this means we are not who we claim to be. Check this out, y'all. You can come to church as much as you want. You can give to the church as much as you want. You can serve in the church as much as you want. You can clean up the church as much as you want. You can listen to almost every sermon Pastor Johnson has preached to our church. And with all of that, if you haven't experienced God's discipline through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you, my brother, you, my sister, are not a child of God. You are a creation of God, but not a child of God. Child of God is a badge of honor. You don't get to wear that badge of honor if you haven't turned from your sin and trusted your faith in Jesus. If you want to have that badge of honor and being a son and daughter, of God that I encourage you to turn from your sin and to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. This is why the writer of Hebrews says to not be disciplined means you are illegitimate. Illegitimate in the Greek means born not in a lawful wedlock but of a female slave. I want to I pray Bible trivia. Y'all ready? Bible trivia real quick. Who in the Bible was born out of wedlock? Let's see. <laughs> Who in the Bible was born out of wedlock? It was in Genesis. I give you Father Abraham. Ishmael. There you go, Vika. There you go. There you go. Ishmael in the Old Testament. The Bible says Abraham was told by his wife Sarah to go and sleep with her servant, Hagar, because she could not bear him any children. After Abraham and Hagar had their little rendezvous, Hagar conceived and eventually gave birth to Ishmael. Uh, realistically, CJ, Ishmael was Abraham's first child, but he was not Abraham's promised child. Isaac was. And because of this, Ishmael did receive a blessing from God because he was a son of Abraham, but God would only establish his covenant with Isaac because he was the son that God promised to Abraham and Sarah. So as Ishmael was considered illegitimate due to him not being born from Abraham and Sarah, those who are not disciplined by God are therefore considered illegitimate and not children of God. Discipline from God is proof you are sons and daughters of God. No discipline from God means you are not. So the first exhortation we are given as the children of God or what our response should be to the discipline of our father is to endure the fatherly discipline. Last and final exhortation we are given as children of God on how we should respond to the discipline of our father is to submit to fatherly discipline. In addition to what the writer of Hebrews has previously stated, he continues by saying in verse 9, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. I hear you. I hear you. Well, Pastor Roland, what if you didn't have your earthly father in your life to discipline you? Please note, 
that earthly father here, just as son, I mentioned earlier, is another way of saying sons and daughters. Please know here that earthly father here in Hebrews chapter 12 is another way of saying an earthly parent. So whether it was your earthly father or not, this is what the writer of Hebrews is getting at as far as discipline. That could have been your mom, could have been your aunt, could have been your great-grandmother, could have been your grandmother, could have been your grandfather, or even your own uncle. If we respected our earthly parents who have disciplined us, look at what he says, shall we, not, shall we not be much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? What you'll know here in this question to his audience in the text and us this morning is that he's saying is if we can submit to our earthly parents' imperfect discipline, we should submit even more to the one who is our spiritual father whose discipline is not only perfect but life-preserving. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Our parents, our parents' discipline was imperfect. Yeah, my mama's uh, um, discipline was imperfect. My auntie's uh, discipline was imperfect. Your mama, your auntie, your grandmama, your uncle, and them. Their discipline was imperfect. And I know it's hard to believe that, but yes, their discipline is imperfect. They don't know what they really are doing. Only God does, <laughs> because they're imperfect. Know this, that the discipline of God is not meant to take your life. It's meant to preserve it. Because here's the thing. They discipline us, referring to our parents. Those, who, those of you who have parents still in existence, those of you who have parents that are not in existence, they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them. They, referring to our earthly parents here in the text, discipline us the best way they knew or know how. Not on a permanent basis, but rather on a temporary one. The discipline that they supply and they, they gave us or are giving us is only temporary. It's not going to be forever. Why? Because eventually they're going to be transitioning from this earth. Their discipline to us or was is not to last forever as God's discipline is to us. God's discipline, on the other hand, Tracy, is for our good that we may share in his holiness. Simply put, the benefits of being disciplined by God is that we will be as holy as God but to be as holy as God, that means his discipline is necessary. I hope y'all heard that. Trust me, I get it. None of us like hearing that word discipline. None of us don't even like to experience discipline. Whether you are a kid now or whether you're an adult now, we don't like to receive or experience discipline. Because, hear this, of what's associated with it. Pain. Right of Hebrews, there, verse 11, he says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Yeah, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. Think think with me. Think, think. Y'all know y'all daddy, Tracy. You know your daddy, uh, Dennis. You know your daddy. I know my mama. <laughs> y'all know that family member. When you were disciplined by that person, it was nothing good about it. It stung. Lord have mercy. I can still feel it now. But please know as you keep reading, the, the writer of Hebrews doesn't stop there. As you keep reading, he continues by saying, later. I like that. I like that. Later. It yields. He's talking about the discipline. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Simply put, God's discipline may be painful for the moment, but it will be worth it later because it will produce, hear this, more peace and righteousness for those who just endure through it. And I don't know about y'all this morning, but I'm getting tired of sin. I'm getting tired of all the evilness. I want and you should want more peace and more righteousness. And if you want it, you can get it, but you got to go through the discipline to receive it. There's a story about a lady who saw a uh, lady who saw this ranger handling a 300 pound loggerhead sea turtle. Chase, you ever seen a loggerhead? I looked it up, bro. It's pretty big. She see, she sees this woman uh, handling this 300 pound loggerhead sea turtle. And if you don't know, these, these you just need to look it up. These are some huge turtles that live by the sea. This particular turtle, in this particular day, was just laying eggs. She became somewhat disoriented and began walking in the direction, listen, not toward the sea, but farther into the sand dunes. 
The ranger, she sees this, came and pried her from the ground, flipping her over unto her back. The ranger put chains around the loggerhead's legs, hooked it onto his vehicle, and drug it back to the sea. He finally got to the edge of the water. He unhooked the animal. The loggerhead saw where it was, and the loggerhead went out into the sea. Now, surely the loggerhead was being chained and drugged, Cheryl. It was hard for it to understand what was happening. Sometimes it's hard to know whether you are being killed or saved by the hand of the one that's turning your life upside down. When you are on your back being turned every which way but loose, you don't know whether God is doing you in or delivering you. When he puts you to lie there, you don't know which way is up. You don't know lying flat on your back. But guess what? Sometimes, hear this, God makes us to lie down. God will take the credit for putting us on our backs to fix whatever is wrong and make us totally anemic within ourselves. Because as it was the goal of the ranger to get the loggerhead back in the sea, the goal of God for us as his children is to produce a greater harvest of holiness. But to obtain it, we must bear through the ups and downs of God's discipline. The Father's discipline. Let us pray. Amen. God, how good you are. And how loving you are, Lord. Even in your discipline, Father. Perfect. No flaw, no imperfection simply perfect. And we thank you so much, Father, for putting up with us. Hmm. We haven't thought all the right things. We haven't said all the right things. We haven't done all the right things. And yet, and still, you still put up with us. And for that, we We are appreciative of you. And Lord, I just want to specifically pray for the person, Lord, who has not yet turned from their sin and trusted in Jesus as Savior, Lord. I pray that they realize, God, that life without you is meaningless. Life really doesn't exist until we place our trust in you. Without you, Lord, we're not really experiencing true life. And I pray for the person, Lord, that they will get to experience true life. The word says it. They, they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead and shall be saved, Lord. We trust God that you will save that person on today. But not only do we want to pray for the person you will lead to trust in your son Jesus, today, we want to pray for the person who has made a decision, Lord, but hasn't yet gone public in obedience by water baptism, Lord. If we say here at Harvest, baptism doesn't make you a Christian, it marks you. So, Lord, we pray God that they will go forth with that Lord decision, Lord, that they will go public with their relationship to acknowledge their allegiance with you. So not only do we want to pray for the person you are leading to trust in Jesus, the person you're leading to be baptized, but also the person who is a Christian, who has been baptized, but has been on the fringes, um, wanting to decide on if they want to make harvest at home. We pray, God, that you will lead them to make their decision. And whatever decision is made, Lord, we just pray that you're glorified in it, Lord. And Lord, as we prepare to give, we pray that you will bless those who have already given and those who are about to give, that you may continue to support the mission and ministry of this church. It's in Jesus' name, amen.